Well, welcome back again to the Art of the Matter. Today we're returning to our study of Moses and Michelangelo, which we began two weeks ago. We see Moses seated here in his position as Moses the lawgiver, with the two tablets of stone containing the Ten Commandments tucked under his arm on the left. This fits perfectly with the theme of the third sermon in the series on the God-saturated life, dealing with how we live our lives in the public sphere. Moses was a public figure most of his life, but the lectionary reading for today reveals how he became so effective as a leader after initially trying to do everything in his power to get out of doing this very job. When the Lord had become angry with the people for their rebellion and their worship of the golden calf that we saw last week, he vowed that his presence would no longer go with the Israelites. He would send an angel before them, but he himself would not go, for fear that he destroy them in his anger. Moses pleads with the Lord, You've been telling me, lead this people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You've said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord finally reassures Moses that his presence will go with them after all. And then Moses goes further. If your presence does not go with us, Do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. You can hear both Moses' love of the Lord and the desperation in his voice at the thought that the Lord will no longer be present with him and with his people. Moses, as a leader, identifies himself passionately with his people, but he knows that neither he nor they can go forward if it means going without the presence of God. God at last agrees to reveal to Moses the very nature of his presence which is to say his justice, his mercy, his compassion, as he passes by Moses, hidden in the cleft of a rock. And it is by staying close to this presence in private that makes Moses the effective leader that he is in public. And so we return to our statue. Why do you think Michelangelo decided to depict Moses in this particular position? What moment was he trying to capture? I have yet to read a satisfactory explanation of this, and there have been many. But for what it's worth, this is mine, and I like it because to me it seems so obvious. Signorelli's fresco from 1482 was already in the chapel in the series of the frescoes based on the life of Moses on the south wall of the chapel. And it shows Moses seated and reading the law to the assembled people, as he does in Deuteronomy, which is literally the second giving of the law. This is Moses, the lawgiver, depicted in Signorelli's early style. We will soon see how that style developed because Michelangelo was very influenced by Signorelli, and not just in the seated posture of Moses taken from this picture, but in the style Signorelli developed when he was commissioned to paint a scene of the Last Judgment in Orvieto. And we will come back to that shortly. But Michelangelo's Moses has much more energy and pent-up force than is exhibited in Signorelli's fresco. What influenced Michelangelo so that he was able to achieve such dynamism in a seated figure? This is a statue called the Laocoon Group, 
that was unearthed outside of Rome in 1506. And Michelangelo was one of the few people present as this remarkable sculpture was dug out of 1,500 years of soil and debris. It's an image inspired by an event that occurred during the Trojan War. Perhaps you remember that at the end of that war, the Greeks built a huge wooden horse in which they hid a number of their most elite warriors. The other Greeks pretended to sail away, hiding their ships in a nearby harbor. The Trojans thought that the Greeks had departed in defeat, tail between their legs, so to speak, and left behind this horse as a kind of offering to the offended goddess Athena. The Trojans were delighted that their enemy had given up and were going to haul the horse into the city walls as a victory trophy. But there was a Trojan priest and seer named Laocoon, the central figure you see pictured here, and he tried to warn the Trojans that they were making a mistake. As he famously said, I fear the Greeks bearing gifts. But before his words could have an effect, the god Poseidon, ruler of the sea and opposed to the Trojans, sent two sea serpents to attack and kill Laocoon and his two sons, which is what we see happening here. So, in fact, his prophecy was in vain. This sculpture had an immediate and profound effect on the whole world of art. Never had the dramatic and theatrical Hellenistic style been so powerfully expressed. Never had the musculature of the male body been seen to convey such an extreme of emotion and strength. Michelangelo was completely in love with the human body, and particularly the male body. So you can imagine the effect that this had on him. Please notice the foot of Laocoon, uh, which is on our right. It's raised and pushing off, giving the figure a certain liveliness, the sense that he is about to stand, but his motion has been arrested. The body and head twist sharply towards our right, while at the same time leaning toward the left. This twisting and turning add to the suggestion of tortured movement. Michelangelo borrowed some of these ideas to add energy to the seated figure of Moses in order to make it seem as dynamic as possible while maintaining a dignified seated posture. He borrows the idea of the right foot pushing against the surface below him, one knee lower than the other, which would push his body to the left. But his body and head turn slightly to the right, as you can see from the way the shadows fall, and he's pulling his impressive beard to the left. All of these details, creating slightly opposing, counterbalancing forces, give the statue energy. And Michelangelo had had plenty of time to experiment with seated figures, which he used numerous times in his frescoes on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which were done after the discovery of the Laocoon statue and before the sculpture of Moses. These are just four of the Old Testament prophets and he painted many other prophets and sibyls in various renditions of this pose. And since we're talking about the Sistine Chapel and how his work there might have foreshadowed the work he did on Moses, let's take a look again at Moses' head. Now let's take a look at some images of God that Michelangelo painted in the Sistine Chapel. God creating the sun and moon. God stretching his hand toward Adam to convey the spark of life. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that the God of the Sistine Chapel bears a sti striking resemblance to the sculpted figure of Moses. 
Now I'd like to give some consideration to Moses' magnificent beard. There is no way that this is going to escape anyone's notice. Why would Michelangelo make such a point of drawing the viewer's attention to a beard? And why make it so improbably long and full of curls and swirls? Well, I have a theory about this, but it involves a story, so please bear with me. Michelangelo knew he was a genius, but he had a rival who was also a genius, and one to whom he was and is frequently compared, and that was Leonardo da Vinci. Yes, Leonardo was 23 years older, but he was still going strong when Michelangelo burst on the scene. In 1503, the city fathers of Florence wanted to commemorate two famous battle scenes on the walls of their council hall in the Palazzo Vecchio. Leonardo, who by then was in his mid-fifties, was commissioned to paint a scene from the Battle of Anghiari, one of many battles fought in the long wars between Florence and Milan in the 15th century. He had just painted the Mona Lisa and a few years before had completed the Last Supper in Milan. So his fame, based on these and other works, was widespread and secure. In 1504, Michelangelo was just 29 years old, but already regarded as a prodigy. He had completed his Pietà in Rome in 1498, and in May 1504, in the very month that Leonardo was revising his contract with Florence, trying, as usual, to push back the date for completing his battle scene, Michelangelo's statue of David was installed outside the Palazzo Vecchio. Suddenly, it seemed that the incomparable Leonardo had a rival. In fact, we know that after the David statue was revealed to the public, Michelangelo was hired in direct competition with Leonardo to paint another battle scene in the same building and on the same wall where Leonardo was at work. That was to be a scene from the Battle of Cascina, fought between Florence and Pisa in the 14th century. Sadly, Nothing remains of what the two artists actually painted on these walls, if, in fact, the project was ever completed. Drawings for the battles exist. Some beautiful ones, of course, by Michelangelo, and wonderful ones by Leonardo. But the entire wall was painted over in the 17th century. So what the final result of the contest was is anybody's guess. What is not in doubt is that this competition, pitting the two men against one another, was to, was to lead to a lifelong enmity between them, if not downright hatred. They were completely different in temperament and demeanor. Leonardo was an elegant, sophisticated, urbane courtier at ease with princes and the aristocracy. He was extremely handsome, some would say beautiful, and was always gorgeously attired. Michelangelo was solitary, introverted, and difficult. He wore scruffy clothes, which he might not change for many days at a time. He wasn't very concerned about personal hygiene. As a youngster, he had been taken under the wing of the Medici family, who afforded him his first exposure to beautiful works of art and encouraged him to cultivate his artistic genius, particularly in sculpting. However, he got into a fight one day in the Medici gardens with another aspiring young artist and came away from the fight with a badly smashed and broken nose. As a result, he would always feel disfigured and ugly, which only increased his sense of being uncomfortably different from everyone else. 
So the two artists were very, very different personalities, in addition to being rivals. But there was a larger, larger rivalry playing itself out here, and that was between the two forms of art in which each artist excelled. Leonardo looked down on sculpting. He thought a sculptor was little more than a manual laborer, always covered with dust and grime and having to do backbreakingly hard work. A painter, however, barely needed to get his precious hands dirty, and he was creating a magical intellectual illusion, capturing the world of three dimensions in two a challenge that was not even open to the more pedestrian world of the sculptor, which was, by its very nature, three-dimensional. In Leonardo's eyes, a sculptor merely copied something nature had already produced. Sculpting required nothing like the imagination and creativity it took to create an illusion of a three-dimensional object on the flat surface of the canvas. Michelangelo had heard about Leonardo's genius all his life, probably ad nauseam, and he had also heard what scintillating company he was, what a brilliant conversationalist, who devised such clever diversions and follies at court, such brilliantly drawn inventions of things like flying machines. But he was also notorious for leaving dozens of projects unfinished, and many of his inventions existed only on paper. Very few had ever actually been tested. And he seemed, at least to Michelangelo, to live off of his wealthy hosts, flitting from one glittering court to the next, leaving when his host got tired of waiting for Leonardo to complete a long-promised project that in the end was never realized. Michelangelo thought that Leonardo was a bit of a poseur. This rivalry and a sense of mutual disdain continued unabated all their lives. And this brings us back to Moses' beard and the question of why Michelangelo lavished so much care on it. You see, Leonardo <clears throat> was obsessed with the flow of water and the twisting forms of vegetation. Spirals, curls, torrents, whirls, and eddies, and so on. He filled countless sheets with studies of the flow of water and likewise the flow of hair and the way it could be braided and plaited in so many complex forms. Take a look at his 1474 portrait of Ginevra da Banchi. And let's just focus on her hair. It is so exquisitely and so intricately rendered. And the newly discovered portrait of Christ as savior of the world, recently sold at auction for close to half a billion dollars, was authenticated in part as a genuine Leonardo by the treatment of Christ's curls. Nobody except Leonardo did curls like this, in long, complicated helixes and tight spirals. So it was a very real challenge for Michelangelo to show that he could deliver the same kind of extraordinary suppleness and fluidity in stone that Leonardo achieved in paint. And if he could do that with the much more obdurate material of stone, then he would have scored big points on his perpetual rival. And I think that is exactly what he is up to with Moses' beard. It is absolutely incredible. It could be a twisting stream of water, a torrent, a waterfall, but it is hair. And Michelangelo has made marble appear as soft and sinuous as anything Leonardo could paint. And that is the reason, I happen to think, that Michelangelo devoted such extreme attention 
to the incredibly luxuriant and unyulating curls of Moses' beard. To prove himself and the art of sculpting to be more than equal to any challenge that Leonardo and his art of painting might present. We spoke earlier about the fresco by Luca Signorelli in the Sistine Chapel, which I suggested inspired Michelangelo to create a seat at Moses for the tomb of Pope Julius II, which, as you remember, was supposed to be in the Sistine Chapel in close proximity to the frescoes of the life of Moses. Sometime after Signorelli painted this fresco, which already reveals a certain love for the nude male body, he was asked to decorate the San Brizio Chapel in the cathedral at Orvieto, which we know Michelangelo passed and visited on his travels through the Italian countryside between Rome and Florence. You can see where the red A is on the map, indicating Orvieto, that it's right between Florence and Romeo. Rome, excuse me, Romeo. <laughs> the frescoes that Signorelli painted there between 1499 and 1504 profoundly affected Michelangelo and definitely influenced his work in the Sistine Chapel, which in turn influenced his work on Julius II's tomb and on the statue of Moses. The cathedral itself is absolutely spectacular and well worth the visit. And so is the town of Orvieto, even if you don't make it to the cathedral or the chapel, but I hope you do. Here is the entrance to the chapel. And when you walk in, you're totally overwhelmed by frescoes completely covering every wall, including the ceiling. This is a scene of the resurrection of the dead, with archangels above summoning the people to arise. Here, the blessed dead have come to life and are being given their golden crowns. But Signorelli definitely had the most fun with his images of the damned and the devils tormenting them. For some reason, images of evil and of hell are often the most interesting and arresting work of many artists, and that is certainly true of Signorelli, with devils tossing the damned through the air or flying them around on piggyback and then inflicting unspeakable tortures on them. He clearly relished depicting depravity. There's no escaping the fact that the way Signorelli painted the clearly delineated musculature of the human body impressed Michelangelo, who employed similar techniques in his frescoes in the Sistine Chapel, and after that, his sculpting of Moses. As I mentioned in part one of this series, Michelangelo felt this was one of his finest and most lifelike works. And the story is told that as he was finishing up and putting the final touches on Moses, he struck the statue on the knee with a tool, causing the indentation you see here, and exclaimed, now speak, as if a voice was all that was lacking to show that Moses was fully alive. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our study of Moses and Michelangelo, and that you'll tune in next week for a last look in the rearview mirror at Moses as he turns over the leadership of the Israelites to his successor, Joshua. In the meantime, be safe, be well, be blessed, and see you next week. <laughs>